At Bitcoin Amsterdam, you meet the most fantastic people. People who think global, people who think local, people people think technical, people people think about money. And Georges Provost is really a guy who knows everything about Bitcoin from a technical perspective. He's part of the core group of programmers. And I just want to know, how does this core group function? How do they come up with new ideas? How are things executed, tested, etc.? So Shorts has uh, agreed to basically tell me a little bit about that. So under the hood of the, uh, of the group, of uh, the core group. Hi, Shorts. When um, a little bit before we start, uh, what is your background before you were hit by the, uh, the orange and the blue pill? Before I got orange pilled, uh, apologies for my voice, by the way, listeners. I've been at a conference <laughs> yes. Nice conference. So what did um, you do before? So I was a, a physicist, at least that's what I studied. Yeah. I didn't practice it. And then I became a software developer, which happens to a lot of physicists. Yeah. And then after many years, I decided to start working on Bitcoin. Well, I, I learned about it in, I probably, I first heard about it in 2011, explained to my friends why it was stupid and a scam. <laughs> I still have those emails. And then I... Um, I think a year later or so, started paying a bit more attention, learned about also the sort of smart contracting aspect of it. Mm -hmm. This was long before Ethereum and things like that. And then a year later, I still found it interesting. And this was this was curious for me because I tend to be very much uh, interested in one thing for a few months and yeah. then disinterested. So the fact that it held my attention for more than a year mm -hmm. and it combined uh, computer technology, so pr programming with money, because as soon as you buy like 10 cents of the stuff you have to put it in your own wallet and now you have to understand what the hell your wallet is doing and then it turns out it's all open source code so you can fix your own wallet you know fix fix your own bank basically yeah. uh, so that really got me hooked yeah. and also I, I found the whole macroeconomic story uh, financial Fascinating. Crisis stuff very interesting I was yeah. following that for much longer yeah. so this all came together and since then I've been focused on that I worked for a company called Blockchain.com for a few years. They make a wallet. Yep. I helped them rewrite that wallet. My first, bit, my first Bitcoin wallet, uh, actually. Which, what year was that when you used it? I think uh, 2014 or something like that, 2015. Yeah, then you may have been using the wallet that was the first version of that wallet, and I helped sort of with the second version of that wallet. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think they've reincarnated it again a few times, so software keeps getting rewritten. Yeah. And then in around 2017, I decided to go off, do my own thing. I wasn't sure what yet, but I wanted to stay in the sector, but, but work on my own projects. And I stumbled into something in Bitcoin Core that didn't do what I wanted to do. And so I decided to make a pull request. So that's a, a proposed change on GitHub, where you, where you basically say, okay, I'd like to add this code to the project, and this is why, mm -hmm. and then other people will review it. Yep. And uh, that's how I got sucked into the rabbit hole of working on Bitcoin Core as a developer, mm -hmm. which I've been doing now for five years. Yeah, and, and you do that, uh, first you did it for yourself, and then later you basically, how do, you, how do people who work on the core, I mean, uh, describe that scene a little bit for us. Yeah, also just to describe the thing itself, perhaps. So Bitcoin Core is a piece of software that you download, and it primary, its primary goal is to download all the blocks from other peers, so it has to find them, and then to verify that the blocks are obeying the rules, rules of the Bitcoin network so that they have enough work, that the signatures are not fake, that sort of stuff. And that's, that's a primary goal, but it's also a wallet. So you can use it. It's not the nicest or prettiest wallet out there at all, uh, but it is probably the best reviewed wallet because a lot of people pay attention to every line of code in that wallet. Um, so, so it's safe. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that adds some safety uh, to it. Uh, but it's all, so basically I work on that too a lot, that aspect of it. Um, that's all to say that, um, What's the question? Yeah, yeah so, 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 that, so the thing is, I mean, when I first, uh, in 2014, I did the first Bitcoin conference, and, you know, and, and I tried to get all kinds of companies together, and then we had a couple of uh, core developers and, who described how the system worked in, the, in those days. We're a small group of people, there were maybe 10 essentials and a bunch of people around it, and that kind of stuff. So now we are in 2022, you know, how is that, how is that group organized? How many core developers do we have who really work on the core, and, 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 and how, are they, how are they getting paid? Are they being sponsored? So describe yeah. that world a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So what I, was, I think I was getting at is that when you say the core, it's not as clearly defined. Many cores, the, yeah. the, you could say the core is the verification of the rules and the changing of the rules. So there's a very limited aspect of what Bitcoin Core, the software, is doing. So there's some confusion in names. Um, so if you look at Bitcoin Core, the software, 
I think it's maybe 20 people who work on it full time, probably less, and then maybe 50 or 60 who work on it a few days a week, and then there's hundreds that will just uh, almost drive by contributors. So they, they, they show up once, they make a really nice change or a really trivial change, yeah. could be either, yeah. and then they completely disappear. So, some of them are anonymous, yeah. some of them are not anonymous. So it's still a very, very small group, okay. And I, I would, yeah, I would definitely say it's a small group. Yeah. Uh, now the the I mean there's a lot of people working on Lightning, and that group you know is almost similar size. Yeah. Um, then the question, your second question was how do people get paid? This varies a lot. Mm -hmm. So you have people who were in there from the very beginning, and they might be independently wealthy. Um, so then they can do that. There's people who work at companies that need to use Bitcoin software, and their employer just lets them work Sponsor. some of the time or all of the time. Not even sponsored. They're just employed and yep. that's what they do at the company. Yep. Now some companies like Blockstream, you know, formerly they're a business, but I would describe them as geeks with too much money. So <laughs> they, they are working on Bitcoin stuff for the business, but really they're, they're just working on it because they find it interesting and if they were not allowed to work on it, they would quit and work on it anyway. Mm -hmm. Then there is a group of people like myself who are sponsored by different companies. Uh, at the moment, uh, BitMEX is sponsoring my work. Um, who is BitMEX? BitMEX is a very large exchange. To rip, I don't even know what they do. Yeah. But I don't have to know what they do. Yeah. Uh, basically, they let me work on anything as long as it's open source. So everything, every code I write is given to the community. It's not mine. And um, yeah, as long as it's useful for Bitcoin. Yeah. And, why, what is, and what are the interests of companies? Why do they do that? Is it more so to the contribute to the community or they get insight or where things are going? or? Uh, that probably varies too. I mean, uh, for one thing, it's they need that they need the software of Bitcoin to work and not fail. So it's in their yeah. interest. Yeah. But of course, there is a tragedy of the commons thing Absolutely. there where you yeah. want the other companies to do it. So I think part of it is that the companies that have been around for a very long time really appreciate the use of it, and so they'll sponsor it. Some of them might just do it for PR re PR reasons, like to be seen uh, contributing. I don't I don't mind what the motives are. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, it, it is difficult to imagine if this will be sustained forever, yeah. because it's not common with open source software. Uh, it's the same with internet. You know, just also a huge that it was a whole bunch of people from all kinds of different reasons, sponsored, not sponsored, and and, mm -hmm. and it was a really big, huge open source project, uh, which is a lot of uh, same the same trends. Yeah, and of course, if you do it part time, then it's much more flexible. You could be a you know you could work part time for money and part time just do what you find interesting and contribute to open source that way. Yeah. So there's all sorts of different ways that these things are, uh, yeah. that developers are funded. Okay, so we have this group of 20 and 40 and 60 and there's lightning and all kinds of different things. And, and how, what kind of communication tools do we have? Do we have a weekly meeting with, with uh, Zoom or is everything email or is it, is it a chat or is it Telegram or what, what are the, the ways that people communicate together and slowly move to decision making? So right now, I think the most important communication tool is GitHub. GitHub, that's a yeah. that's the place where the code is hosted. Now, keep in mind that GitHub is basically a place to combine different Git repositories. Git itself is a completely decentralized system, mm -hmm. so every developer has a copy of the code on their computer, and not just the code, also every change to the code that was ever made is recorded, very much like a blockchain. In fact, you could call Git a blockchain if you want to. Um, so, but we use GitHub because it is a very, it has very nice collaboration features. So you can open what we call pull requests, which is basically just a page that says, I'd like to change the following. And then other people can see who is opening a pull request. They can see exactly what lines of code are being changed. And then they can test that on their own machine very easily. They can also comment on it very easily. So you have sort of the social media style interaction, except you're talking about work, of course. So you will say, Okay, I think this is a good idea. We, we call that concept ACK as, as, a, as an abbreviation for it. And then you can say, well, I think the idea is good, but the code itself is wrong. And so you'll say, okay, this line is wrong, this is wrong, this approach is wrong. So you get a lot of uh, criticism on what you're doing. Not all, some people are nice about it, some people are not as friendly about it. So you have to be, you have to have a little bit of thick skin to work on it because people will tell you what's wrong with your code. And that's good because if people are too nice, you don't want to get bugs to get in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so then you can simply reply to those critiques or you can fix those critiques and that's all visible on one page so it's very easy for the next reviewer to follow along. 
So that's the main tool. The other tool would be IRC, Internet Relay oh Chat. Oh my God, that's beautiful. So that's a long time ago. It, it has a nice, and this is not meant to elitist, but it has a nice barrier to entry. Yeah. Uh, if you're actually interested in the project, it's not that hard to set it up. But no. if you're completely disinterested and you just want to spam people, you, you won't put in the effort to figure out how IRC works. The other thing is, of course, it's actually open because things like Slack, you're just dependent on one company and if they don't like you, they can shut it down. Also, it's very, uh, and Discord has the same problem, it's very hard to audit. So, um, if, you know, if you don't have a Slack account, you cannot see what's happening in some Slack channel somewhere. Uh, so, that's why it's good to, to use IRC or maybe in the future, maybe Matrix Chat might take over yeah. that. So then anyway, then, so yeah, then you have a but, but that IRC channel is more for, well, there is a weekly meeting, but only a fraction of people actually show up at those meetings where people can just propose what they want to talk about. Because sometimes it's better to have a, a quick chat about some problem than to have lots of back and forth on, uh, on GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's basically what it does. Yeah. And the, occasionally people will run into each other at conferences or, yes. or meet up yeah. uh, uh, in subgroups. Was this a good m conference to meet up with um, core developers? No. Uh, because they're all, uh, many of them are in Atlanta at the Atlanta conference. There's a lot more developers there, which is almost at the same time. Okay. So then we have a communication channel, and we have a basic way to to set up a proposal. And uh, and and how, and how does a, how is a change being accepted? What is the process of uh, getting a decision? Yeah. So this is based on the um, the idea of what what was invented by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. They had a similar problem. Uh, they wanted to develop standards for browsers and things like that for the internet, where nobody's in charge. Generally, the rule is um, anybody can propose a change, and then you have to make you people any, and anybody can review it and then the review should have technical criticisms and you as the proposer should address all of these technical criticisms so addressing can mean fixing what somebody tells you to do or explaining why it should not be fixed yeah and once enough so once enough people have looked at it who have the right expertise mm -hmm. and you have addressed all of their concerns mm -hmm. by fixing it or explaining why it's not a concern yeah then it's ready to go, essentially. Then no. uh, so and, if, and then if, if people don't object anymore or don't come with suggestions, it's sort of automatically decided? There has to be enough review. So you cannot get something through because nobody looks at it and nobody objected to it. No, okay. it uh, so a lot of things get stuck because nobody reviews it. So your idea might not be controversial, it's just that nobody has time to review okay. what you're doing. And if you are, have a longer reputation and people respect you more, they are, tend to look more at the code and they tend to put in more sweat, code, equity, review uh, than other people. I guess, I'm not exactly sure if that's true. Uh, new people also get a lot of attention. It, it, it probably also depends on if you're fixing something that people care about. So if, if there's something, if you're using the software and you find something annoying, and somebody else is fixing that for you, then you're very happy that they're doing that and you're very excited to test what they're doing. Okay. So does that. Um, I mean, it, it is a very uh, anarchy system, basically. So nobody's in charge. Nobody can say you should review X or you should review Y. Uh -huh. And it's also sometimes a bit difficult to coordinate because it's not in person. So um, there are, at any given time, about three to 400 uh, pull requests open. Three to 400 things you can look at. Yeah. And GitHub uses notifications, so when somebody comments on your pull request, or if you ever commented on a pull request and somebody else comments on it, you get this little blue dot that says, oh, somebody uh, replied, right, just like on Twitter. So this creates a strong recency bias, because you tend to pay more attention to the stuff you get notifications for. Yeah. And this, this does tend to, what tends to happen is if a pull request is open and it doesn't immediately get a lot of people actively on it and then it gets merged, yeah. you may get stuck in limbo for a very long time because nobody gets notifications about it. It's not on the first page anymore. Uh, and it can take a long time. Some of the longest ones are open for five years. Uh, some of the shortest ones just for an hour. So, you know, it varies. Okay. So, there's no official decision-making moment. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of action, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of comments. And then at a certain point when you say, okay, it's going to be merged, when is it going to be merged into the code? Okay, I should distinguish between two kinds of changes. Okay. One is changing the rules of Bitcoin. That is a much more complicated process. Okay. The changes I mostly talked about with Postgres are changes to Bitcoin Core, the software, but that do not impact the rules of the system. So you might change the way the wallet works, 
or um, the way the, the program starts up or clean up something in the interface, yeah. making no, no, it faster, okay. yeah. those kind of things because only the users of the software will care about that. Now, if you're saying, hey, I want to introduce a soft fork like Taproot, things get, there is a little bit more of a formal process uh, using the uh, BIP system, the Bitcoin Improvement Protocol, okay. for, sorry, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal, Proposal, where you write a piece of text that explains what the rule change is you're suggesting, yeah. et cetera, et cetera that goes on the mailing list generally, not on GitHub. And the mailing list is a little bit more accessible to people who are not constantly looking at the code. That will take a lot of discussion, probably years. Um, a lot, but, but the rules are generally the same. It's again, you, anybody can propose a change to Bitcoin, but it has to withstand scrutiny. So if, if you propose, say, something like, I want to double the block size, then you'll get a reply saying, well, that will break old software because the old software cannot handle these bigger blocks because it will reject it. And then you have to, you know, then explain, okay, oh, yeah, let me, how do you address that? And you probably so won't. As long as you get a lot of uh, kickback that people do not agree and start piling objections on objections, nothing will ever, and nothing will ever happen. Yeah, exactly. If, if you propose something and people object to it and you don't deal with those objections, then nothing happens. So the status quo is nothing happens when it comes to the rules anyway. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> we just saw somebody coming by <laughs> with, an interesting, yeah, <laughs> with an interesting thing. Okay. So um, that was actually one of the things I wanted to ask you. I mean, um, in 2018 or 19, I don't know, but there was this whole blockchain, the block size uh, debate. Yeah, 20, how, how 2015 was the, to 2017. Oh. Yeah, it was uh, unbelievable long and, and, and painful and uh, from, from an outsider view. How, how was that inside? I wasn't inside. Remember, I started contributing to Bitcoin Core in 2017. So I was actually one of those outsiders looking in and also wondering why these things took so long. So. Part of me joining Bitcoin Core as a developer was also that learning process of, of trying to understand why these things take so long and um, trying to form an informed opinion about what is reasonable for block sizes. Uh, but if you look at it now that I have this experience and I look back at the discussions from that time, yeah. it is more obvious to me why it took so long and why it didn't happen. Because people would simply say, let's double the block size. And then people would say, yeah, wait a minute, uh, nodes can't handle that. Uh, you know, it's not backwards compatible. And then they, w they would not actually come up with good technical solutions to those objections. Instead, what they would do is they would go on podcasts and in the media and make, make a lot of noise about it. Uh -huh. And then the general public that does not understand this process of rough consensus, as it's called, so finding consensus by proposing something, critiquing it, and doing something about the critique, etc. They just sidestepped the process, and that created a lot of anger and friction. Uh, because it's very easy to go on a TV show and say, well, yeah. blocks must be bigger, it's good for the economy. Um, yeah. And it's much more difficult to go on, you know, to reply to that and say, well, but wait a minute, people have to run these nodes, it has to be censored. It has to be censorship resistant. We don't want the government to be able, or anybody else to be able to censor transactions. So as many people as possible have to run a node. In order to do that, you have to deal with bandwidth. You have to deal with memory in your computer. These are all scarce resources. And this is difficult to explain. It's probably easier to explain now, yeah. because you just point them to Bitcoin SV and see, this is what happens when you have one gigabyte blocks. Nobody can run a node anymore. There's like five of them in the whole world. Um, that is a clear example of there is an extreme limit to it. So that was uh, that was what's going on back then, yeah, but it was very frustrating for a lot of developers to uh, yeah. Yeah. So for the the more introvert, normal people who were rational and wanted to have arguments, it, it was very hard. The, the people who had a big, big, big noise, big voice, and made a lot of noise, uh, they basically make this whole system uh, just uh, crumb to a halt. Well, they, they basically sidestep the decision making system yeah. by by just going to the general public and doing it that way. Okay. And uh, that's that's that'll always be a risk, I think, to Bitcoin, that people will try to push through changes to the protocol, sidestepping the careful engineering process, and just using media popularity. And as Bitcoin gets bigger, that threat, you know, there's more money at stake too to do that. Yeah. So that's definitely a threat, and that's also why people should continue to first of all run their own nodes, and second of all, when you update the node to a new version. You know, keep an eye on whether maybe Bitcoin Core as a group gets co-opted by those kind of people. Yeah. And then maybe you just don't want to download an update at some point. There may be a time when you just should not install the new version of Bitcoin Core. 
I hope that moment never happens, but it could happen. How and is of course, the, yeah. Bitcoin Core is not officially an organization, so no. if this... If, if Everybody this can join and add and withdraw. Yeah, exactly. So what could happen is that a bunch of people take over the domain, for example, uh, bitcoincore.org or something like that, and, and engage in this type of bad behavior, but then maybe those 300 people that are normally contributing run away and regroup somewhere else, and either they take the brand with them or they come up with like, you know, Bitcoin not core or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So then it becomes more difficult for the users because they'll have to understand which of those two pieces of software is the real, the real Bitcoin quote unquote. Yeah. Now the good news is they can generally just choose to do absolutely nothing because the way Bitcoin is designed that every change is backwards compatible so that if you have an old version of Bitcoin core, you don't have to update to, to be able to keep using it. You might not be able to use some of the new features. So Taproot was introduced a year ago. If you don't care about Taproot, you don't have to upgrade. No. Asterix, just some complications. And what is Taproot? Taproot is the most recent soft fork. So it is um, basically uh, similar to like SegWit was a soft fork, right? Taproot allows you to do a couple of cool things. It m mainly allows you to add signatures in a way that they look like a single signature. Mm. So y you might have a setup where you have three different hardware devices, but to the outside world, they can't see that. And even better than that, you can have secret clauses mm -hmm. with which you can unlock your coins. So you might have a rule that says, I need three signatures, or after one year, I only need my mom's signature, one oh, signature. Okay. And you don't want the world to know that that backup plan exists because then they just kidnap you or they, you know, they yeah. wait for a year. And so you can hide this backup plan from the world, and unless you actually use that backup plan, because then you have to reveal it, it is yeah. not known to people. Oh, okay. So yeah. this is what Taproot enables you to do. It, it also, you know, for, for some reasons, makes uh, some things in Lightning easier. It's quite subtle. It's not like you don't no. write billboards like, buy Taproot now, it's awesome. No. Um, okay. Yeah, and that was done in the usual process, and there was not much drama around it, so. How is the atmosphere now in the, uh, in the group? Uh, are there big, huge issues? Are there big divisions? Or are there big uh, discussions going on? What, what's, uh, how would you describe the uh, atmosphere? I think it's mostly just get, getting work done. Right. Um, no drama. Most, look, most of the work is, is very tedious, like just fixing technical stuff that does not involve drama. Obviously, there's always drama somewhere. I mean, no, one of the things I described is that if your proposal doesn't get enough review, it's just not going to go anywhere. And there are some proposals out there that have, you know,